Well, I'm excited to introduce Patty to you today. Um, as the nursing librarian, I've worked with Patty for about eight years off and on, and um, it's been a delight to work with her. She brings warmth and humor to uh, anything that she's working on. So um, in addition to her many accomplishments, it's always fun just to, just to work with Patty. So Patricia Ravert was appointed Dean of the College of Nursing at Brigham Young University in 2012 after serving as an Associate Dean for several years. In 1975, she completed her undergraduate degree in nursing at BYU and began a professional career with Intermountain Healthcare for over 20 years. Dean Ravert joined the BYU faculty in 1999 and she taught senior nursing courses as well as served as the coordinator of the Nursing Learning Center and the Clinical Simulation Laboratory. Additionally, in 2011, she was inducted as a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing during the organization's 38th annual meeting and conference in Washington, D.C. for her outstanding contributions to the nursing profession. She was also inducted as a fellow in the Academy of Nursing Education with the National League for Nursing and as a certified nurse educator. She is a pioneer in simulation learning in nursing education, particularly high fidelity simulation. Her scholarship trajectory includes examining simulation design, integration and implementation, and evaluation of simulation experiences. She was selected as one of nine national experts for the NLN Lairdal Medical Simulation Innovation Resource Center project. And this CERC project provides resources for nursing faculty to learn how to use simulation through creative online courses that support faculty development. Of the courses currently available, she designed two, one on curriculum integration and one as a co-author on faculty development. Dr. Ravert received her associate's, bachelor's, and master's degrees in nursing at BYU, after which she received her doctorate from the University of Utah. She's the mother of five children and the grandmother of 11, with one on the way, and we're excited to have some of, of Patty's family here with us today for the lecture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patty Ravert. I'm sure that was my children. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for coming, all, you know, with my family and many of my friends and colleagues, and and uh, great to see people here. And, and Eva Stoneman, she retired from the college, and really appreciate her coming. And Beth Cole, who was the dean previous to me, and appreciate her coming. It's her birthday today, you guys. So <laughs> just so you know that, you know, with it. But I appreciate you all coming. And you know, I was asked to talk a little bit about you know, my scholarship and where we've been, and it's really integrated into my work in the college. And I think that's a, a really exciting piece of why I've been successful. And it's been successful because of great people I work with. And, and uh, as Betsy said, I've worked with her, and I'll say, hey, I need literature on this, and help me figure this out, and she helps me. And I mean, it's, it's a group effort, you know, with that. And so the people surround us are the ones that really help us. So I wanna, share, I wanna give you a history lesson a little bit. And so I'm gonna give you a little brief history on uh, two things, um, learning the healer's art, what does that mean, and how that came about, and then also on simulation and simulation in healthcare education, and what, what does that mean, and what, what I'm doing and what we're doing in the college. So the first part is learning the healer's art. So as we started planning, and I wasn't there, this was time ago, this was during the 40th anniversary of the um, College of Nursing, they were looking for a theme and trying to figure out a theme. And there were, um, the dean at that time, as well as the associate deans, they uh, were thinking about it, working, and. I'm sure they were praying about it. But anyway, they, start, they sang, started singing a song. And actually, Mary Williams was, heard this and came and joined them. And the song that they sang was this song that we're all familiar with, Lord, I would follow thee. And in the third verse, these are the words. I would be my brother's keeper. I would learn the healer's art. To the wounded and the weary, I would show a gentle heart. I would be my brother's keeper. Learning the healer's art is where this came from, you know, with it. So they um, got permission from um, Susan Evans McLeod and Newell Daly to use this. This has really been the, a college hymn that we use a lot. And even um, Sister McLeod, she actually wrote two special verses for us 
as well. So that's kind of where this came from. June Leeson was the dean at the time, and you know, it, it has really started from that. So we're talking 40 years ago, that was in 1992, a few years ago you know, with it. Also during that time, a, a piece of artwork was commissioned, and this is um, by Trevor Southey. And it, um, again, it was to encompass that piece of learning the healer's art. This hangs now down in our learning, nursing learning center area. You'll see it down there. It's kind of in the student study area with it. And it's a large painting. And again, it's a piece that's been important to us. So during the 50th anniversary, so 10 years after that, 2002, learning the healer's art theme was fairly well established. There was actually, um, they put together a book of healer stories. And it was for faculty and, and nursing students submitted their stories and this was published. So the healer's art, 50 stories for 50 years. Also, not too long before that, BYU had actually acquired that the Carl Block painting of um, Christ healing the sick at the Pool of Bethesda. And if you have not seen that painting, I think most of you have, but if you haven't, you need to go to the library, and, or not the library, the Museum of Art and see it. It is absolutely beautiful. Well, that is where our celebration began. It was in front of that, that painting. Also, um, the uh, College Alumni Association, Carol Bush was the chair at the time. She actually marshaled them together and the college of, or the college alumni associate donated a replica of that painting to, uh, to the college and actually hangs in the Dean's conference room. And so this is the painting as you can see that there. It's a beautiful painting and it really represents healing and, um, and, and Christ's work with that and what does that mean. So then from there we went on and the piece of trying to define what the healer's art means. And so, you know, what is the real meaning? What is the practice in the daily work of the college? And as we're trying to teach students, what does that really mean? So uh, Mary Williams was instrumental in that and, and really guided the faculty on the journey of trying to define, define that. And so what we talk about is the healer's art, as it says here, is to practice the healer's art is to emulate the principles, knowledge, attributes, and methods of the master healer to foster environments and processes to help others to be made whole. And nurses, we know about Florence Nightingale and you know, her influence, and some of those things that are in this definition are exactly what Florence Nightingale talked about, talking about the environment of healing and, and with that and how important that is. Not only were, was this definition, we also came up with the principles of the healer's art. So when we talk about that, we invite the spirit, we emulate the savior, we use heart, mind, and hands, we create healing environments, we awaken the powers of healing within ourselves and our clients or patients. So that's where this kind of all came together you know, with it. And throughout our curriculum, it's really infused in there. And the students talk about the healer's art. We talk about it as faculty. It's really part of our curriculum. So during the 60th anniversary, which is a few years ago, 2012, the theme was well established at that time. And again, we teach the human aspect of caring for people in health and illness along, the along with the technical and professional skills. So again, you know, as I, I want you to keep that theme in mind as we talk about simulation and simulation in healthcare education. It was interesting because last year I was invited to give a talk in England, and of course I said yes, it was in England, you know, with it. But it was about how do you teach caring and how do you teach this type of theme within our curriculum and with simulation. And again, Betsy helped me with some literature to, you know, it's become so much a part of us. I'm thinking, so how do we teach that? And so I shared some of those things, of course, with them. So um, uh, we have a mission in our college, and this is the mission. It talks about uh, develop professional nurses who promote health, care for the suffering, engage in the scholarship of the discipline, invite the spirit into health and healing, and lead with faith and integrity. 
So that's one history lesson. Now I'm going to move on to the other history lesson that has to do about simulation and simulation in healthcare education. So when we talk about a definition of simulation, you know, it, there's a million different definitions, but these are a couple. I think they're fairly typical. But simulation is something that represents something else. It isn't the real thing. At times, you might perform a simulation as a practice for real life. And something that is made to look, feel, or behave like something else, especially so it can be studied or used to train people. Well, let me tell you a little bit more about simulation. If you look at history-wise, in the military and combat, a lot of simulation in there. So you can see these old time things with practicing with a sword and a shield, and then there was jousting and war games, and those are all simulation. And uh, some of the young people have probably played military simulations on their videos, you know, with it. Those are all simulation with them. So another important piece that has really moved of simulation along is really in aviation. And it's really moved to higher technology, um, many businesses, but particularly aviation. So the first uh, flight simulator was really built three years after the Wright brothers flew their plane. So that was the first you know, one. This is a picture drawing of maybe what that might have looked like. Actually, I saw another one one time that looked like it was a box with a broomstick. That was about all it was you know, with it. <laughs> and then they moved to much more complicated and much more as today with flight simulators. So they're very computer driven. And you know, when you think about computers and, or com flight simulators, what, what do they use them for? And one is for what they call, and you see this in the literature, in the simulation literature, all the two, crew resource management. And when I first heard that, it's like, what? What does that mean? And it's how the crew should act, how they come together. If there's an emergency, what are they supposed to do? And who's supposed to do it? So it's crew management you know, with it. So the other piece of it is really practicing the stuff that you want to never see happen. Okay, so think back, and you all were aware of a few years ago when there was um, the, pi the airline pilot uh, Chesley Schullenberger. Have you heard that name before? And he landed a plane that got into trouble. The plane actually ran into a flock of birds, lost both engines, and he landed it in a river. We've all seen those pictures, you know, with it. Well, why he was successful is because he spent hours and hours in simulation, taking, simulating the things that you want to never see happen. So keep that in mind as we talk about healthcare simulation. So when we, um, when we talk about healthcare simulation, okay, one of the first labs that we had here at BYU, it was called the Auto Tutorial Laboratory. Now, I went to school here in 1974, you know, 71, so, you know, that type, that era. Okay, that was kind of during that time. I can remember going in there with the headphones. We had slides like this shows. We also had film strips, and they would like ding, and you had to advance it to the next. Do you remember that, you know, with it? We also had some what we call task trainers. And so, this, these couple pictures show some task trainers here, so you'll see one with injections and, and the other one starting an IV on a fake arm, you know, with it. So we call those task trainers injection pads. I put oranges up there. Well, I mean, there are places that that's how they taught people to give, give injections. I can remember myself as a brand new nurse. I was working on a youth unit. We had a patient who was a newly diagnosed diabetic. She could not go home until she was taught, until she could actually give her own injections. Well, we had done the orange over and over and over again. And so I came on shift, I worked the evening shift, coming to work at three, and they said to me, we have got to get her to give her a shot. She's, that's all that's holding her up from going home. So I, that was my thing I was gonna do and make sure she did that. So we did the orange, I said to her, so, you know, you've done that. She said, I know, but I just don't know if I can actually do it, you know. And I said, do it to yourself. What do you mean? You know, she said, you know, just giving it in a real person. I said, well, I'll, I'll help you. And she said, you've never done one before, have you, on yourself? And, okay, I'm telling you, I lied. <laughs> and I said, oh, yes, I have. <laughs> and I hadn't, anyway. She says, okay, show me. So I drew up some saline. It wasn't, it wasn't 
the medication. It was saline. I drew it up, and I, I'm sure I was a little shaky, and I gave myself an injection into my leg where I was teaching her to give that, you know, with her. So she said to me, okay, okay. And then I said, so now you need to do it. She said, to you? <laughs> and I said, okay. So I let her give me a, a, a saline injection into my leg. And then I said, now it's your turn. So that's all simulation, you know, with it, okay? So um, I'm just telling you, we do things on each other over in the College of Nursing, I'm telling you. So you might not want to hang out, you know, hang out over there too much because you might end up with, you know, getting a bed bath. No, I'm just kidding, anyway. <laughs> but the students, we practice on each other. We actually practice on mannequins and that type of thing. Those are all healthcare simulation. You know, there was one time where it was all apprentice, where you see one, you do one, then you teach somebody else, you know, with it. Well, we're trying to not do it quite like that. We're doing it more with simulation. So I'll tell you a little bit more about simulation mannequins. So as we um, talk about mannequins, um, they're really tr used for training and for practice. Oftentimes, they're full body mannequins. Let me show you a picture of one of the first ones that was used for healthcare education. This is Mrs. Chase. This is the Chase Hospital doll. And Mrs. Martha Jinks Wheaton Chase, she was a doll and a toy maker. And so, um, so a uh, they were trying to teach healthcare workers and everything, and they came to her and said, We need a life size doll, and we don't want it just stuffed with sawdust or straw or whatever. We need it to have joints that move and with it. So she actually made some of the first mannequins for healthcare. And they actually kept making them, not this exact one, you know, with it, clear till 1981, and then the business closed. But, so that's one of the first one. But most of you are probably familiar with Recessa Ann or Recessa Annie's. And they were first developed in 1958, and really to teach cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And the first ones of those were full body mannequins, and if you're a nurse, everybody's learned CPR on this type of a mannequin. Now with time, things moved into more of the basic care mannequins. These are typical mannequins. We have them for the whole family, the age, you know, with them. And these mannequins, um, originally, they had, you know, things that you can switch out and make them have different kinds of wounds and all the different things that you might need to learn in fundamental skills, you know, with them. Um, now they can be even more sophisticated. They used to be a couple thousand dollars, and now they're running more about ten thousand dollars for each one. But you know, they they we do a lot, and we still use these basic mannequins today. You know, with them, maybe not the exact same ones, but we use them, and we have several of them. You know, nine or ten or twelve over in the College of Nursing. We then from time, then we moved into computerized mannequins. Now this is an old picture, and you can notice here in the background, see the guy sitting there and he's got that large kind of bank and everything? Well, that was the computer to run this little simulator here. And he was, this was developed by an anesthesiologist in California. This was in 1969. And it would do, um, it had pulses, and it would give a blood pressure, and they could give anesthesia to it, you know, with it. It really supported four different drugs, but no matter what you gave it or how much, the vital signs responded exactly the same. Things went up a little bit and some things went down, and that was it. So it didn't matter if you gave too much or not enough or whatever. So anyway, as time went on though, within the um, community, they just said, there is no place for simulation in this, in this type of environment, you know, with it. Well, let me tell you, it's really changed from there. So today's patient simulators, it's a really a new level of realism. So they're a high fidelity mannequin, and that's where that term high fidelity comes with. It's more, it's much more realistic. And so it says on here, you know, sophistic, sophisticated computer software. That's true. It's very computer driven, but there's also gases that do it. So it has pulses, respirations, it actually has chest rise, um, blinks, you can actually um, talk for it. You have somebody in a different room that actually talks for it, that type of thing. So you can program things. And actually is a physiological response to it. So if you're gonna give a medication, then it responds as if they were given that medication. If you gave too much, it responds negatively or whatever, you know, with it. 
So I think the, the important piece about this is that as things moved on, these, these simulators have actually grown and been developed more so. So we actually got one of the first simulators, high fidelity simulators in 2001, I'll talk about that in a minute. But that was $250,000, that simulator was. It actually had a gas analyzer, so you could actually give it anesthesia. It was the first one of this new kind of new, you know, new phase of simulators, and it was kind of the only model available. The models of today are different than that for different purposes. The ones that we currently use, we don't need the gas analyzers because we're not in a school of anesthesia. So they run about $85,000 a little more than what I'd like to pay for something to take home with me, but you know, with it. But anyway, in 1999, I came from the clinical setting, so I came from Intermountain Healthcare, and at that time, Sandra Megham was the, uh, one of our faculty, and she was over in the Nursing Learning Center, and about a year after that, she announced that she was getting ready to retire. So they actually did do a national search, and, and I don't know all the behind things, because I wasn't involved in that. But anyway, they came to me and talked me into being the new supervisor of the Nursing Learning Center. I don't know if they talked me into it, but kinda. Because at the time, I was really busy. I was in a PhD program. I was new faculty. But anyway, I, I said, okay, sure, I'll do that. So she, she was orienting me, and I've sometimes joked and said, 25 years of knowledge she was trying to dump on me. And it was very overwhelming. And then, as she said, as, just almost on parting, she said, oh, by the way, Dean Marshall, so Elaine Marshall, has ordered a human patient simulator. And I said, what's a human patient simulator? She said, well, I, I, don't, I don't really know that much about it, so you'll have to figure it out. And she was getting ready to retire, and she wasn't dealing with it, you know? And so I said, okay. And so I thought, if I'm gonna learn about that, I'm gonna use this as part of my PhD program. I'm gonna study and find out about what, what that really is. What I did find out is the, that there was one patient simulator, human patient simulator, at the University of Utah. It was in the Department of Anesthesia, and I had to beg to let them come, let me to come look at it. And so I went and looked at it, and they, were, they talked to me about it a little bit, and nursing school wasn't using it. It was really only anesthesia. So let me tell you about our program at BYU. We, we are a six semester baccalaureate program, so we admit as sophomores. We um, admit usually, our usual pattern, 64 students twice a year. And we ha I always get to ask the question, how many males? And it's really seven to 15%. Now our last class had 18% admitted, I'm just telling you. They're, high, they're bright students, you can see they're admitting GPA. We've got um, students from a variety of countries with us. We have a very high pass rate on the NCLEX. Now that exam is very important. After you graduate from nursing school, you have to take a national exam so that you can become a registered nurse. So nationally, in fact, we were just looking at this yesterday. Nationally, the national average for this past year was uh, 80, 81.5% and we're at 98.44. Yay for us, anyway. So as we talk about, um, teaching the healer's art. One of the things is, is that we combine teaching that really in our theory, didactic, clinical, and our lab courses. And the simulation is included in part of that. So, you know, it's how do you teach that? How do you teach the lear learning the healer's art? So part of it is setting expectation. The simulations that we do in our college, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you one of those in a little bit. But anyway, are really grounded in caring and understanding. And then modeling caring behavior as well. So again, here's a picture of our first simulator. And after a naming contest, it was named SAM. And even today, students will say, we're going down to the SAM lab. We have six different ones, but they still call it the SAM lab. That, that, that's okay, you know, with it. And um, like I said, we, uh, we do lots of different scenarios with that, and we'll talk more about that. But this was in 2001 when we got this. So then, with my doctoral work, and Betsy and I were talking about this before, so as every doctoral student does, is you really do an extensive review of the literature to see what's out there. So I did that with the help of others, 
And what I was really looking at was I wanted to see if I could find quantitative studies, so studies that use numbers to help figure out is simulation helpful or whatever. So, and I wanted to determine the effect of simulation on educational learning. It is really interesting because that question I was asking in 2001 was recently, very recently, just published on a multi-site multi -site study that was done by the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. So they actually did a randomized and they had um, different types of programs and so they substituted they had the regular with what they had been doing before. They had 25% of their clinical was with simulation or 50% with simulation. And what they found is that there was no difference. They were effective. All of them were effective. And in fact, there were a few things that the simulation was actually better with. So the question that always came up was, how do you know this is effective? Well, we do know it's effective now. We also... Um, we would, us simulation people would say, well, how do you know standing up in front of a classroom is effective? You know, <laughs> how do you know, you know, that way? So simulation might be. So anyway, there was always kind of that debate. Well, what I found on my original is there were 513 articles, nine of them met the criteria, and only four of those had anything to do with nurses. Not any of them with nursing students, they were all with nurses. Well, um, I've done some other things. Betsy and I, we had a stream going and to bring in literature. This is a couple of years ago now, but I was getting 100 articles a week, probably many weeks, on simulation and nursing, simulation and healthcare. So it, you, could, you can hardly keep up with the literature today. But when I started in 2001, there was hardly anything out there at all. What we found on this is that 75% of the studies showed positive effects you know, with it. So again, that was um, published, and it is quite often uh, referenced, which is when people are doing their studies, they're having to look back and see what's been done, and so it's kind of an interesting thing with it. So then I wanted to look at, for the, my study, I wanted to look at critical thinking. Now, critical thinking was a major buzzword in nursing for years, and it was in the essentials of the baccalaureate education. It's, it's uh, you know, it, it's even hard to define, but anyway, we, uh, I wanted to look at that and because I thought, you know, simulation may enhance critical thinking and problem solving. So that's what we looked at, I looked at. I actually had three different groups. There was the um, group one, which had the enrichment activity with just discussing scenarios. So they had their regular class, which, which was group three, that was the control. And then we had a group that just talked about different cases. And then we had the second group that really did five different scenarios on the human patient simulator. The other thing during that time is I knew that I could not do this alone. Simulation and running simulation experiences is not a one-man show or one-woman show, however you want to say that. But anyway, it takes a lot of people. And so one of the things that I did as part of my um, original work is to start using students to help run the simulators. Well, that is still fairly unique. And we have people all the time asking, how do you do that? Well, we have wonderful students at BYU, and we hire them, we hire them as soon as we can, keep them engaged, and they love working down in the lab. And so we use students to run our simulators a lot. So I use the California Critical Thinking Disposition Inventory and the California Critical Thinking Skills Test. And so I looked at gain scores. So the difference between the post, or post scores and, pre, and pre-scores and, the, and it was a positive for total scales and the subscales, but there wasn't any statistically significant difference between the three groups, okay? So I took from that, okay, we didn't do any harm, you know, with it. We, you know, at least it was okay, you know, with it. So that was um, the, first part of, the first part of that particular work. Then the next study I really did was I looked at student perceptions, because I want to know if students liked it. I thought they did. But I don't know if I was hearing from all students. You know, I might have been hearing from just the ones who thought it was great, you know, whatever. So um, in phase one, I had two phases in this. Phase one, we invited all of the first um, medical surgical course. So they had five simulations. We used a, a, an instrument that I found in the literature and looked at that. It had some um, subscales of whether it was, you know, whether it realism, whether it transferred, whether it was valuable and satisfaction. And then on phase two, I actually, um, we did study or focus groups, and then we used some additional instruments also. 
there were at that point they were new instruments from the National League for Nursing. And uh, so what we found is that on the positive side, you know, they 100% felt the experiences were valuable. It really did contribute, and nearly all all thought the scenario helped them to get where they needed to be with their technical skills and prepared them. And so, you know, greater than 90% felt like they were, it helped them get ready for whatever testing they may be doing. Where they thought needed help, I, and I think this is interesting, but about 30%, they felt like they need an orientation to the patient simulator, which is true. I mean, it's like, so you come in and here's this fake thing, and it's like, what do I do, and what can it do? So that kind of changed a bit of how we even use the simulator and, and introduced it. And then 23% of them thought the pace of the clinical simulation didn't reflect the flow of an actual clinical setting. That's true, because let me tell you what we do. We do in a simulation in 20 or 30 minutes, which may have something that occurs over the entire shift. or sh So it's very compressed time with it. And those of you that are nurses know that, you know, when you've got students out in clinical settings, there are times when they're not doing anything or, you know, sitting or, you know, checking on something, you know, the patient's busy sleeping. That makes sense, right? Busy sleeping. They're, they need that to heal. You know, but so there are times when there are slower times. Well, we don't have slow time in simulation. We're pretty busy all the time, you know, with it. So it doesn't always reflect real life time. On phase two, like I said, we use these other three simulation instruments. And the National League for Nursing, they did a multi-site study looking at simulation, how it could be used. And from that, then they developed this model. And the model then, there were three instruments. And you'll see this model used quite a bit. I've actually done a variety of things with this model as well. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So on the focus groups, I mean, the students were, you know, thought it was a great thing and we should continue it and new skills and they actually want to have it every semester. So, you know, at that point, we're trying to start integrating that, but it really wasn't in every single, every single class. So, you know, the results, most enjoyed the simulation experiences. They want it to be as real as possible. Most think that it, it does help them and help them to be more confident when they get to a clinical setting and they do want more simulation. Um, I did a couple um, publications off of this, and you can see there's a couple of the names on here. These are students. These are student workers that had helped with the simulations. So I helped them, and we worked through a variety of things with that. Now, when we talk about simulators, we also got other simulators. So we, we um, purchased a high-fidelity birthing um, mannequin, and it actually births the baby. And, um, fairly realistic. The other thing that's interesting about this one is you can, you can have it simulate things that you don't want to happen. For example, you don't want somebody to have a postpartum hemorrhage, so you can simulate that. You don't want somebody to have a breech delivery. You don't want somebody to have what's called a so, sh shoulder dystocia. So we can simulate all those things, just like the pilot, when he, was, he practiced the things that you don't want to happen. But you want to know what to do when, you, when those do happen, and you want to know what the response is. So the birthing mannequin we have, we've, we've kind of birthed to death a couple different mannequins. And we're actually currently looking at the newest model to buy another one, because we birthed a lot of babies through this mannequin. So we also purchased a um, high-fidelity um, pediatric simulator. So again, these simulators help us to simulate different things with different patient populations with them. We're actually on our second child simulator because we, you know, wore one out too. So as far as how do we use it now in our program, so in the first and second semesters, which they take fundamentals and care of the older adult, we mostly use static mannequins and task trainers. There's a scripted scenarios. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. But really, we are teaching nursing skills and professional nursing behaviors as the, the patient as a whole. And um, we teach these nursing behaviors. So we did a little work. Deborah Himes, is Deborah here? Oh, good, I can lie. Okay, Deborah Himes, okay, so the other Deborah. Okay, Deborah Himes, 
she um, is, she's a faculty member over the fundamentals lab and so what she was recognizing is that the instructors that were in there were spending way too much time talking about things and not doing the hands-on so it was like 75 25 and so this you know the the students turned off you know their brain as well as you know other things maybe anyway but the whole piece they were out of context so that they were t teaching a skill just as that skill rather than as part of the whole patient experience you know with it and the and the and they were minimally involved and so we uh, revised the approach and um, we started using what's called unfolding case studies and so what happens with that is the the patient stories develop over the semester and each patient has a complete chart with a history you know the nurses notes the the physicians notes whatever it is that's in a chart they're all there so you're teaching the students about how to care for a patient in context with it the other thing that was going on is there was peer mentoring going on it provides a learning individual attention but also collaboration within there and then we also wanted to model and look and we actually rated people on critical nursing behaviors so when we talk about that we have these we had the simulator which that's what the simulator looks like this is a static one meaning that it doesn't have chest rise and all that kind of stuff you know with it well then we mock them up and we actually put a picture at the head of the bed so that they know who it is that they're doing so they meet these four patients and the four patients in this particular situation um, there's Izuku and she's 78 and she fell and fractured her hip and so they have to not only learn to do a bed bath but they got to do a bed bath with all of the stuff that goes along with fractured hip another one had an ATV accident and had some internal complications and ended up with a colostomy another one ends up with cancer and dies so they're going to talk about and deal with how do you take care of a patient after they expired you know that type of thing so there's peer mentoring that goes on in a variety of things they're paired up you know you can see them helping one another there's roles with them so there's a the nurse role and the coach coach role they work together and like I said it's very scripted so there's the script here you know with it well the student feedback says I know we had to know about the patient's individual conditions and think critically as we did our care I feel like I learned the most during scenarios I get to know my patient this next one is interesting because she talks about I want to learn to be I want to be better prepared it's like that's what we wanted them to come to lab prepared you know with it need to know what's going on and then this one I know knowing I think knowing what to say is almost as important as what to do now they're both important but this was like I said from a from that well now the outcome of that study was really and that change that program development and change was that they're much more involved much more engaged than they were before and and they really learn the healers are and to care for the whole person person and we had a publication with that as well so during third semester it's medical surgical and they learn a variety of things so these are things that we think every student should have an experience with chest pain heart failure all these different things you know with us so they know what to do during fourth semester which is care of families and children and also their public and global health there's the obstetric pediatric and community and public health so during the obstetric I showed you a picture before of our simulator here's another one so they learn these different things they go through these different experiences in the pediatric one they may do asthma diabetes and the public and global health they actually do a poverty simulation Deborah Wing's been really involved in that as several others as well and in that it's really helping them walk in their shoes and understanding what happens to people that are in poverty it's an eye-opening experience and um, during the clinical portion of this course which is taught in the spring our students go to various places so they have different types of culture cases also and so one of the one of the areas is in the um, veteran population so I want to share with you a little a little video that was done by um, here at the college on Shannon Reynolds and Shannon is, she says in there that she's a student and this was taken a year or so ago she graduated a year ago in April but she was in the veteran clinical portion so this video
talks about her experience during her senior year in actually an employment situation. So I'm going to show you that. I'm Shannon Reynolds. I'm a nursing student at Brigham Young University. And last spring I had the opportunity to take a class in the BYU nursing program that focused on veterans and the veteran population and how by understanding our veterans better, we can care for them better. And I saw that in my own experience soon after that class. I started working as a licensed practical nurse just a couple weeks after um, that course had finished. And I started doing home health medications for a gentleman named Bob. He had had a stroke, which left him um, with the inability to speak. He could nod his head yes or shake his head no, and that was about it. The lady that offered me the job, the lady that helped me get the job, and the nurse that took me to Bob's house the first time, they all warned me that Bob hated new people. He wouldn't even look at me, he wouldn't smile, he'd hold his G-tube so just so I wouldn't give him medications. He just hates everybody new. That's what I was told. And so I was really worried going into it. Um, just unsure of how he would approach the situation and how I should approach the situation. So I went to his house with another nurse who was showing me around. So this nurse has been working with Bob for a year and surely enough he glanced at me when I walked in and looked away. And I was like, okay, but I expected that. <laughs> and then as we were preparing the medications, I noticed a photo above his television of a veteran. And I asked the nurse, I was like, is he a veteran? And she quickly said no. And I explained that I was just wondering because of the picture on top of the TV. And she told me, that's not Bob. And then she looked at it a little bit more closely and was like, actually, I don't know. I've never asked him. So when we were giving Bob his medications, I asked him, I said, Bob, are you a veteran? And he looked at me and smiled and nods his head. So this is the first, first time I've met him. And the nurse is amazed that he's smiling at me and looking at me. And so I went on to ask him about which branch he served in, asking yes or no questions. Did he serve in the Marines? Did he serve in the Navy? Turns out he served in the Army. And I just asked him more about it and tears came to his eyes when I asked if he had served overseas. I said we would talk about it later. And I, I told him I would be back the next day to give him his medications. Um, and when I was leaving, he grabbed my hand and he looked at me and smiled again. And the nurse and the aide that were there were just shocked. They're like, he never smiles at anybody or grabs anybody's hand, ever. <laughs> and so they were just amazed. And from that time forward, Bob and I were really, really dear friends. Each time I went, he would smile, he would grab my hand, and I just loved spending time with him. I loved when I got to go help him and give him his medications. And it was all because of that one question that I had asked. It was because I had shown interest in him and because I knew more about our veterans that I was able to care for him better and that I was able to come closer to him as a patient and as a person and it made a, a complete difference in the care that I gave to him um, both from what I did for him and also what he did for me. I think she's a fine example of practicing the healer's art. So in the fifth semester which is the advanced medical surgical we do code blue scenarios and a variety of things. Again, we don't wish those to happen on anybody, but we want to know what to do when it happens. I'm going to show you one of those in a minute. We also do voices simulation. So with the psych mental health, what is it like to have voices in your head like people who, some who have mental illness do? And it's, a, it's an overwhelming experience. It's a simulation on what that is like. And then they also do a simulated mental health home visit. During their last semester, these students are in capstone. They're 210 clinical hours. The labs are open to them at any time. We have walk-in labs. We don't have anything scheduled. We're actually looking to maybe do some multi-patient scenarios, and we haven't got there yet. So we're still working on that. So the overall learning outcomes is to improve communication, increase nursing skills, understand the didactic theory material, develop critical thinking, clinical decision making, facilitate teamwork, and care for the whole person through learning the healer's art. So the, student, the nursing learning center is really the hub of the college. 
um, for the students. It, um, the students spend many hours there. We have 10 to 12,000 scheduled student visits there per year. That's a lot, I'm just telling you. We tell that to other, other colleges of nursing or programs and they go, really? You know, with that, and we just have tons and tons. We had outgrown our area. So last year, we were able to have a remodel and expansion. This is what this looked like. This is what the nursing looked like, center looked like in May of last year. We had a wonderful donation, and it was um, from the Fritz B. Burns Foundation. It came in over a period of time, and so last year we were able to do this, but it had to be done in a short time because we needed it in the fall. So believe it or not, the day after winter semester, it was completely gutted. This is what it looked like in May. I'm there, he's, he's showing me, like, we've got this problem up there. And I'm saying, okay, so what are you gonna do about it, you know, you know with it? So then, by this fall, this is what we have. So we have full, six full simulation experiences rooms with the high fidelity simulators, debriefing rooms, which we never had before, two procedure rooms, exam rooms, more than we had before. We've got nine bed, it's a wonderful place. I mean, I can go on and on. But what I want you to know is that we are so grateful for it. And it makes our students have even better experiences and that we're able to do so more so. So there's just a few pictures. So as you come into the Nursing Learning Center, that's the door there. And you'll see it was named after a family member of the Rollinsons and from the Fritz B. Burns Foundation. But the students are engaged in there. You'll see we, the one on the bottom left is shows the control room and we never had one of those before. And we are thrilled that we have a control room now so we can control from a different area. They can see what's going on. You'll also notice the one on the bottom right, that looks pretty realistic as to a hospital setting, doesn't it? That's back in the simulation area. So I'm gonna show you now a code blue simulation. It's pretty quick. Did you feel prepared for this experience? And let's talk about if you felt prepared to deal with patients. Hey Bill, how's your ID doing? That's quite a cost. I just made up like my It's okay, Jerry, can you have some help? So as part of our debriefing from this scenario today, we've been watching the video, you've been able to see some of the things that happened. So tell me how you felt about the experience. What, is, what were some of your frustrations? What are the things, some of the things you think went well? It's really frustrating when you're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing and then the patient still ends up dying. I, I love working together as a team. And you know, I think a lot of times in these situations you expect them to be kind of cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. And all right, you do it right, and then everything's happy, but and kind of surprised you? It's kind of more like real life. Yeah. So that's a real quick brief of what we do down there in the lab. And these experiences really do help the students be prepared and help them really pull the didactic, the theory, and the clinical together. It's been a great journey. I've done other work as well. Um, I, as was mentioned, I've done some things with faculty development and developed some courses that are online. I also did and participated in a multi-site study looking to see if they saw a role model and so, somebody doing it right first, does that make a difference? Well, you would think it would, and yeah, mostly it did, you know, with it. 
So again, on, and that was a geriatric um, unfolding case study type thing. And I've done a variety of things with Kathy Lassiter and um, Beth Johnson, and they're both really great simulation people as well. Another important thing, I think, in my work is that I was a member of the International Nurses Association of, as you can see, the long name here, Clinical Simulation Learning. We call it a NASCAL, but most people have no idea what that means. But anyway, I was on their board for years. It was an organization that was developed um, probably in about 2002. I was on their board for many, many years. During that time, in 2011, we actually finalized the standards for simulation. What are best practices? They're under revision, but what things had not been out there before. And one of the things that came out of this is that, one, you ought to have an objective. Does this sound like something teachers ought to know? You ought to have an objective of what it is that you're trying to teach and what are the outcomes. You know, And it's that type of thing that we just really put into some standards. And again, it's been a, a good piece with that. I also, that model that I showed you before, it was developed some years ago. And so I ran a group of 20 expert nurse researchers and educators to look at those the five components and give some suggestions which we there have been some changes to that model as well those manuscripts were recently published in a clinical simulation and nursing journal and i just want to end with this here's you know florence nightingale back to her and learning the healer's art and this is a quote of hers the needs of the spirit are as critical to health as those individual organs which make up the body and that's why we teach learning the healer's art. And I know that we can do that through simulation. Thank you again for today. Looking at the time, I'm certain that some of you need to be getting away. So uh, would you like to take any questions? Anybody who needs to leave, you're welcome to, to get up. Are there any questions for Patty? We'll get out of the way so you can answer. Beth. And that's, that is a really good question as you're talking about faculty development. And that was part of some of my work um, with the CERC site, which was a simulation innovation resource center. It's online. And faculty development is really important. In this uh, national study that was just recently completed, not one that I did, it was with the State Boards of Nursing, they made sure that all of those people were trained in simulation. And actually, I saw Pam Jeffries, who is another simulation guru, this last week when I was at a conference in Florida. And she talked about what they, how they trained. And I said, I want to see that article. And so she sent it to me. But I've been a little busy this week, and I haven't read it yet. So. I, you know, it is important because you can't just go in and just do it. It is a different way of learning as well. Good question. Any other questions? Yes. So Karen's question talks about substituting simulation for clinical experience in the, in the hospital settings, clinical settings, because it's hard to find clinical settings with that. And that was one of the reasons that this national study was done. And what they found is that substituting 50%, the students did just as well as they had in traditional or with 25%, passed boards at the same you know, same rate, that type of thing. They're actually following them now out into the clinical setting and see if there's any difference that way as well. And, and personally, if they're well done simulations, I think you can replace some of that. And I think that's where some people, some programs are needing to move to. The other thing has to do with regulations. And some states have regulated that they're, how much you can have or if you can have it all there's still two states a couple states that say you cannot substitute simulation at all well this study should inform them to make some changes with that so we'll see what that means in the future i don't think you can substitute everything there's a whole different thing about really taking care of real people than with the simulators okay good thank you very much thank you